Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review. Today's game up on the tabletop is called Labyrinth Adventures. Labyrinth Adventures is a one to four player DMless quest slash dungeon crawl and even a TTRPG of sorts. Basically, for you and up to three other players, or if you want to play some sort of variant that you kind of create where you actually include a DM, you can do that as well. We'll be undertaking one of the four different classes. This game requires four classes, so when playing with one player, you'll have to use all four, um, but each player can have an individual class of their own. You'll be writing up your class and beginning with different stats and items and armor and potions and spells, depending on the character that you're running. And then you're going to undertake the journey into the labyrinth. Now, this is going to come with the original Enter the Labyrinth quest module for Labyrinth Adventures, and it will give you a certain number of maps you will partake in. These maps are randomly generated. This system is a D6 system, so all you'll need is a bunch of D6s, and you'll be moving through the map, making your own choices, entering different rooms that will contain traps and monsters, and perhaps even some treasure as well. As well, you're trying to move and gather troves of experience and gold, and hit that objective. You'll go through the storybook, in the module, you'll read through the story and go from quest one to quest two and so on and so forth till you encounter the final boss and you'll attempt to defeat them. If your character slash parties all die, then you are going to end and suffer the consequences. But if you can get through the module and beat the last boss, you will remain victorious in Labyrinth Adventures. I'll go ahead and explain kind of how to build a character, the basic aspects of moving and fighting, and then we'll talk about what I think. So to begin, you're simply going to take the book and open up to page two. This is going to tell you about creating your character. It'll have all the different modifiers and what they do, what they stand for. GP is gold, DX is dexterity, ST is strength, so on and so forth. You'll move on to the next page. And after you have uh, went ahead and selected one of your characters, whether it be a warrior, wizard, um, or a cleric, uh, and a rogue, then you're going to go ahead and roll for your strength and dex, your two main stats in the game. There are two options to do so, but I just recommend doing this, this one here. You roll for four d6, take the highest total of the three dice and add it to your strength and do the same thing for your dexterity. And as long as your combined total is uh, over 27, then you're good. Otherwise you can re-roll. You're also going to roll for your HP and it's going to be a 3d6 and you'll add one and you're simply just going to write it on your piece of paper. Okay, I rolled my 3d6, I got three fives, that's 15 plus one, 16 health. You can personalize your character, add any benefits that you, like any type of like appearance or gender, or build, age, it has like things on here as well as you can go ahead and draw something, uh, maybe even the back if you'd like. And then you're gonna go ahead and determine your race. you roll a d6. One or two is a human, two or three, or three or four is an elf, and five or six is a dwarf. And each of them have their own unique stats. Like for instance, a human may add one point to his or her strength by subtracting one point from dexterity and vice versa. And they can do that twice. And elves and dwarfs have their own unique modifiers as well well. Additionally, warriors, wizards, rogues, and clerics all function differently. So for instance, a warrior is chosen and he's a tenacious individual. He's highly trained in the art of combat. Warriors get an extra plus one damage with the weapon they wield and receive a plus one on every 1d6 of HP rolled. So for instance, the warrior is going to start off with more HP than most of the other characters. And then of course, they're going to start with some type of weapon and some type of armor, certain armor proficiency they can use and weapon proficiency, the different ones they can use. And this is kind of listed down below. Wizards and uh, clerics also have the ability to cast spells and they'll actually go ahead and gather other spells from the back of the book, which is basically just choosing the ones you want and adding a certain number of those spells. Some of them are infinite, usually like the wizard's fireball, while most of them have a certain amount you can add. So if I wanted to use more than one hail, I'd have to add one, two, and three points into it, and that would count towards the ten spells, meaning I would go down to seven. Um, and so after you've done that, uh, this is also going to be, of course, you can print these out on the website or you can use these ones here. I strongly recommend you use the one on the website or just go ahead and photocopy these out so you can play multiple times because you're going to want to do that this game. Uh, then your character creation is basically done and you're going to move into the next phase of the game, which is the most fun part. It's entering the dungeon. So welcome to the dungeon. We've got fun and games. All right here is the first dungeon you'll enter in the labyrinth. And just before you enter that, I strongly suggest you go into the module and you read the story. And there's actually a fairly lengthy story with illustrations of what's going on throughout it. And so you'll read through this story here and it's gonna present you with your starting level, what your objective is to do, um, any type of other ben benefits or bonuses. And then of course, it'll move on to like level two and, and whatnot. And it explains kind of what these are. 
and then after you've gone ahead and beaten both of these, then you would move on to the confrontation and the final boss. But yes, always make sure you read the full module with all the stories, see if there's any changes or what uh, items are in troves um, by going through this book. And then you'll see this guy here, which will also photocopy out of the book. And then here you're gonna have your dungeon here. On your dungeon, there is a start space, and that is where your party begins. You're all playing basically together in like an imaginary space um, that is on the board here. And you go, okay, we're gonna start somewhere in the start area, and then we're gonna choose a point of exit. Any one of these little doors here will let you exit. Once you've chosen a door, you're simply going to start rolling to move through the dungeon. And to move through the dungeon, you're simply gonna roll 2d6. And you'll go through these steps here. Basically what happens is you'll roll 2d6, and then whatever you roll is what you're going to encounter. It could be the passage goes straight, or it goes to the right, or it could go to the left. Passages could end with a locked door or an unlocked door. And whenever you enter or go to attempt to like, when you see a, a door, you're gonna go through the next steps of the game mode. One is you'll go ahead and roll to see if that entrance is trapped. And you'll check to see uh, how big the room is. So you'll roll 2d6 and that will be the size of the room you can make. And the rule is basically if you roll a 12, the, high, the farthest you can go is three up and four across or vice versa. So you can't just make these really long corridors. The exit doors, you'll roll a d6 and you'll usually subtract by one. I mean, it depends on, on this thing here, but it just says roll a d6 and that will determine how many doors. So if you roll a six, you will get five exit doors. You can place them anywhere you want on the room on the page. And then the room occupancy. And the room is going to be occupied by a number of things. You're gonna go ahead and roll 2d6 and based on what you roll, we'll determine what you're going to roll on. Now there are beast tables, there are treasure tables. Um, you could roll additional times. You could go with both a beast and a treasure, it just depends. So if I rolled 2d6 and I ended up with um, a 10, a five and a five, I would roll runs for beast tables. And in the book here, there are beast tables. And you go to the very back of the book and you will check to see what you're going to have to deal with. So once I have found this guy here, my Beastopedia, then I will have the option of determining what I'm going to be fighting against. So here are the beast tables and it says I roll a d6. Based on what I roll, I roll a four, I would go to table three. Table three now lets me roll a, d a d6. And let's say I rolled a four, that would be a green slime, which means that in the room is a green slime and you actually go to the Beastopedia and find the green slime, check its HP, its dexterity and its attack, how many attacks it has and what type of attacks it does. And then there's a bit of flavor text as well. And you will go into combat. And once you have finished combat, it's one of two things. The party is either going to, or you are going to succeed and move on. There's a bunch of extra cool rules involving combat where you can choose if you want to not enter the room and let everybody else go in. Um, there's also rules where as you're moving and you encounter an entrance, you don't have to go into that entrance. You can actually continue moving through a different entrance because you're, or, or a different pathway or corridor, because your objective is to get some of these troves so that you can gain experience and level up and get to the objective. And maybe that, that pathway and that room is taking you in the wrong direction. You can also choose to stay on the board as you move along the game. And even if you want, you could actually add an extra map to your map to kind of extend it. However, extending it too far is not going to allow you to reach your objective in a timely manner. So most of the time you want to try and stick to the game board as much as possible. Uh, there is a bunch of unique things you can do in the game. There's kind of before combat, the ability to uh, choose what you want as far as health potions and healing yourself and utilizing spells. There are some instances in the game where you'll be able to manipulate the map with certain spells. And then there's a lot of combat tricks in the game. I think you kind of understand the, uh, the idea of the game. I'll go into combat now and then after that we'll talk about my review. Yeah, so combat for the game. Well, first of all, you will establish an attack order. And the way that works is you will depend, uh, it'll depend upon your mod X, which is your modified dexterity. Maybe your dexterity is, we'll say 15. And maybe for instance, you have an item that gives you a minus one, right? Because you're slower when carrying that item. So you'll go down to 14. That would be considered your mod X, your modified dexterity. Dexterity is just your straight dex. And then mod X is whatever it is modified based on what you've got on. Um, and based on that will determine your turn order. You'll also do an initiative roll uh, protocol, which is pretty, pretty simple. You roll a d6 and the total on one d6 equals the beast slot within the attack order for this combat scenario. Uh, so 
If it's a five or six, the beast will go first. So you have a slot of one through four, and then if a beast rolls five or six, they're gonna go, because it's always gonna go from the bottom up, from six, five, four, three, two, and one, and you'll slot beasts into the position based on the die that you roll. And then you'll go ahead and do the attack order. And you'll, you'll simply check before you wanna go any farther. You wanna see what you can use in this. Maybe you wanna grab a scroll, switch out your weapons, drink a potion, it's all really up to you. Turns, after you have set your priority right, what, what you, what, like the, the turn order, uh, is going to involve doing one thing. That one thing could be uh, dropping an item, um, or, or, or going to pick up a different item, or, or uh, equipping a new scroll, or making an attack. So anything that you do basically is kind of an action. And a round is determined by every single thing in the room doing an action. Uh, when you're in combat and when beasts attack, uh, basically players are going to roll, and based on the person who gets the lowest roll, and ties you rinse and repeat, that will be who the beast attacks. But there are beasts in the game that will specifically target the cleric, or maybe the warrior, based on what type of monster it is. Uh, after you've got all that kind of sorted out, all you need to know is how to attack. And it's going to be based on your mod X. You'll roll two dice, whatever you roll, you check to see if it's uh, equal to or lower than your mod X. If it's lower or equal to, you hit. If you can roll a five or less, you're going to crit, and you'll see this. there's a little crit hit table here, and that includes the monsters as well. Uh, and if it's above, you'll fail. And if it's too high, you will guarantee a miss. 17 is automatic miss, 18 is a drop. So even if you get too high, no matter how good you are, uh, it's still going to fail. Um, and the beasts function in the same way as well, but they have their own uh, dexterity. And you can check in the beastopedia based on the beast that you're fighting. So if you're fighting a giant scorpion with a DX of 12, when they roll the dice, they have to simply get under 12. And you're going to rinse and repeat this order. You're going to determine uh, the attack order. You're going to go from the bottom up, having each player take an action, attempting to either heal somebody or do some damage. Uh, once you've got your hit from the mod X, you roll and you're like, okay, I got a six, that's low enough. Then you'll consult uh, an item that you have or a spell or a weapon, and that is what you'll use to make the attack. And all the weapons and items are pretty simple. It might be like 1d6 plus two, plus I'm this, so I get an extra bonus. So you'll roll the die, and whatever that number is, plus all your modifiers, is how much damage you will do to the unit. Um, you are gonna have armor value as well. If a monster attacks you, however much mod modified armor that you have, like an armor value of two, if you take five damage, you only take three. There are ways where your armor can get melted off, you can lose your armor in certain instances, but yeah, that's that's kind of how combat works. It's a pretty simplified version. It functions kind of like D&D &D as far as combat goes. But yeah, once you've finished combat, it's one or two ways. Either all you guys are dead, or you manage to defeat all the enemies. And whenever you defeat enemies, depending on the beast that dies, generally you're going to be at least getting 1d6 of gold points, but sometimes you're going to get a bonus, like a trove of treasures whenever you defeat a dragon. So all the dragons have a unique... Um, Unique bonuses, like 2d6 gold points. Roll 1d6, um, uh, and you're going to get 1 through 3 as a magic item and, on the table, or 4 to 6, no magic item. So there's ways you can get even more bonuses. They're kind of like bosses that you could just stumble upon throughout the game. Go throughout each location to each location, going through these troves here, checking to see in your specific module that you have in order to gain the values of that trove, and hit that objective point. Move on to the next map, hit that next objective point, and finally come around to that main boss. And hopefully Hopefully you've leveled up enough, and based on your level experience, uh, you're going to be able to level up as far as your modifiers or your, your base stats, as well as your character level itself, and uh, you'll do that throughout the whole campaign of the game. If you're able to defeat that big final boss after you've gone through all of the three different quests, you will win the game. Yep, yeah, let's talk about my review now. That's what I really want to get into. So Labyrinth Adventures is basically like a DM-less D&D mixed with Gauntlet Dark Legacies all played out on a grid with your character sheets. You can include as much DMing as you want, and you're also going to be able to utilize the story and play through this bad boy. But what's also cool about this game is you can actually kind of create your own stories you can actually intermix and there'll be like some type of um glossary or like a su subset of things that you can do and how it can be utilized so that if you want to create your own experience you can do that just something like DD &D can do we're able to make that kind of experience but you can actually play in that experience or you could just be a dm you could function as far as drawing the maps you could be the one that rolls for the monsters and let other players just utilize their cheat sheets so if you want to play with a dm you can and you don't have to 
And you can also make a map and choose to utilize that world and be in it or, or not. Or you just simply go through the modules that they have and play through those. This game is pretty simple. It's kind of like a randomized dungeon builder where you're rolling dice, moving specific directions in the dungeon, finding treasure troves, battling monsters, opening up new doors, creating new doors, opening locks, and defeating not only monsters, but hopefully avoiding traps as well. Uh, up until the point where you fight a big bad boss and hopefully you've leveled up enough. So it has this kind of like Final Fantasy 7, 8, 9 experience where you need to grind just enough to make sure that you're able to successfully beat the boss, but not too much at the cost of your party and the potential for bad things to happen. Uh, speaking about bad things happening in this game, when you start the game off, and you roll and you enter a room, you might fight a bunch of dragons. It's possible. It's not likely, but it's possible. Um, you can also potentially run into a room and fight a bunch of small things. Now, these things are kind of based on your level, so they're not gonna be impossible to beat. And in my first playthrough of the game, after I've got it rinse and repeated this playthrough here, um, I fought against a bunch of these things. I fought against a bunch of dragons and was able to defeat them and get through the dungeon. Now, of course, it just makes it more challenging and eventually you have the potential to die if that happens. So may the luck of the dice be with you, so to speak. Uh, this game has some cool little interactions as well. When playing as like a warrior, you're going to be having a hefty amount of health. You do quite a bit more damage with weapons. When you're playing as a cleric, you have access to healing. There's a orb that you're gonna get to resurrect players that you can utilize if need be, but it also can drop so other players can take it as well. Uh, wizards are gonna have the special ability of spells. Clerics do too, but wizards have got a lot of them. And they're always gonna to have fireball and these spells can do damage over time per each round they can do a sort of like blight or rot effect uh, they're also able to just throw cast a fireball directly they can use these scrolls to provide some type of benefit and they're this big spell casting class uh, armor value is important in this game. You want to make sure as you go along, you find armor, you can get armor. You want to attach that to your characters as soon as possible because it prevents that damage that you'll be taking throughout the game. Hitting a certain number of troves is important as well because it gives you a bunch of experience slash gold and stuff, and that will help you along as well. And also just the timing of the game is important, like how much is too much and how little is too little type of a thing. And the theater of the mind is in this game as well. You can kind of do as much DMing or as as little as you want. If you just simply want to play kind of a pre-rendered dungeon crawler game, you can do that. Do you want to make your own campaign and, and run through the dungeon of your own choice or maybe make it a map that extends uh, out uh, with the grid and you can have like some experience like, oh, you're crossing the river now or whatever. And you can do that by adding kind of a backdrop to it. There's a lot of ways to mix and match with this game. Also choice, running through a dungeon and then you realize that you're getting too far in one way, you can choose to go another way. And that being said, there is a kind of a negative to it as well where if you <laughs> ventured this far and you keep going and eventually gets too far, having to backtrack and go to a new area. Sometimes areas can kind of come in upon themselves. You might have to open a door. And if you're really unlucky, which I've never seen before, but all the doors are blocked, in which case you can lose that way. So making sure you choose the right locations for doors is quite important. There is a variety of monsters and spells, and the four different classes are a great classic start to this type of a game. I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing all the different uh, new aspects and components to this game uh, now that I've sunk my teeth into this one fully. And uh, what I can say is this is a lot of fun. If you're a TTRPGer that wants to do a DMless campaign that has some pre-rendered or pre-generated type maps that you don't know what they're going to be like as you're rolling, then this is a strong yes for me. If it's something where you want to actually create your own campaign as well. This is an easier form than D&D &D, and it's a kind of an easier formula so you can start by just doing this one before you move on to that one as well. Or do you simply just want to chuck dice? This is a massive dice chucker. It's chucking dice when you're moving, it's chucking dice when you're fighting, and it's chucking dice whenever you're in character stat building or uh, what you get from the monsters, what type of spells or treasure you, uh, you acquire. It's a lot of dice chucking. And you can kind of determine what it is that you're looking for in this game. But overall, Labyrinth Adventures is a lot of fun. As long as you go into it knowing what it is, that there's a bit of randomized chance, you could be fighting all kinds of different things, the paths might not always go the way you want them to, and you might have to backtrack. 
As long as you don't mind that kind of stuff though, and you want something like this, this is going to be a solid purchase, especially because it's just two simple books and really you only need this one here to be able to play um, and make your own stuff and do your own thing, which is, is pretty cool. There's also some uh, resources on the website that will let you print things out. That's where I got these babies here. And I started off in non-color and then I printed in color. And you can use these guys to your liking. And as more stuff comes out, which I imagine it will, you'll be able to have all access to those resources as long as you get the main main piece of components and then for each um, module that you want to increase the storyline from the base game, you're set for Labyrinth Adventures. So yeah, it's a strong pickup in my opinion. Thank you guys for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review, or in this case, tabletop game review for the game Labyrinth Adventure Ventures, along with the module Enter the Labyrinth. Um, you can go ahead and check everything out, labyrinthadventures.com or my site, unfilteredgamer.com blog posts giveaways kickstarter lists and more go ahead and check out this game by clicking down in the link down below in the description if you would like and if you would like you can also go ahead and hit that subscribe button if you think we've earned your subscription if you've watched more than one of our videos perhaps we have in which case pushing that button along with the bell if it's even more so um, something that you like we greatly greatly appreciate it that's pretty much all we got for you this time, guys. Live streams are every Sunday and every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. PST on different platforms. There's a link in the description for that as well. All right, guys, as always, I look forward to entering the labyrinth with you next time.